Make the choice to begin anywhere in your life, and the journey has started. And along the way, be inspired. Listen to the stories by joining the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, on The Journey. As our campus evolves and modernizes with current times, it is essential that we explore the ways in which capitalism and technology can shape a better world for us all. For far too long, institutions like Howard University have been shut out of these conversations. And that's why today's guest and his impacts on our community have been so important these past 18 months. Hello, my name is Dr. Wayne Frederick, and my guest today on the journey is James Ree, the Johnson Chair of Entrepreneurship in the Cathy Hughes School of Communications and a Senior Advisor to the Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership. Mr. Ree, welcome to the journey. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, you now about halfway through your experience here uh, with us at Howard, and I'll dive a little deeper into mm -hmm. uh, kind of the better of your experiences, but maybe you could give us an overarching feedback on what it has been like so far these past 18 months. It's been a warm reception, a learning experience, and everything that you had said that it would be when you were gracious enough to offer me to do this. Um, I've made, made a lot of friends. I've been particularly uh, invigorating to spend time with the students. Um, you know that I'm teaching a class, and I come down every Thursday uh, from Boston. So just being with them, it's 30 of them this year. You know, as much as I love spending time with you and my fellow faculty members, but the students, like, it's really gratifying to really see and hear and listen to them, listen to their perspectives on the world, and, um, and learn from them, too. Good. So I, I want to go all the way back to what about your upbringing you think um, prepared you for some of this? So maybe you could tell our listeners a bit about you know, where you were born and, and sure. what your early schooling was like. Yeah, like the more I, the older I get, I learn more about the historical nature of my life. You know, sometimes you don't really take a step back. Um, I was born here uh, on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx. My parents were both caregivers, like you. My dad was a pediatrician. My mother was a nurse. Mm -hmm. They lived through the worst of the Korean War. So whenever I see the pictures of the Ukraine, my parents were refugees. Uh, they fled. And they came here to try to start a different life. Um, they benefited from Dr. King's civil rights uh, gains in the 60s when the Immigration Acts were lifted, mm -hmm. which I didn't know right up until about 10 years ago, maybe. It wasn't really taught to me like that. Yeah. And so, I'm, yeah, I'm the second son of three kids, Long Island Public School, two caregiving immigrant parents. And I think, like many of your students here, actually, I sometimes had the extra responsibility of navigating the world for my parents, too. Mm -hmm. First kid in college here, first native English speaker, mm -hmm. learning all of the systems from scratch, um, having some pressure to sort of uh, achieve for my broader family, which sometimes is a burden for your students, too. Um, but always feeling very grateful and responsible for the sacrifices that they made for me. Right. Now, w once you um, navigated high school, tell me a, a bit about your higher education experience sure. prior to jumping into business. Yeah, public school kid from Long Island, went to Harvard College, uh, thought I would go there and be a science and math guy, mm -hmm. ended up really studying people. So economics, history, philosophy, literature, basically studying how people behaved. A lot of my work was 19th century uh, antebellum South. Mm -hmm. um, I studied just the intersection of race, economics, legislation, money. Mm -hmm. And then I went and taught high school for two years. It's a pattern. I'm a teacher. Nice. Like, okay, <laughs> even though I've been on Wall Street, I really enjoy people. I enjoy teaching, I enjoyed learning from my students, and then I went to law school, uh, Harvard Law School to be a public defender. I thought I would be a public defender. And um, I don't know, I ended up somehow on Wall Street for a long time, but I think in my heart, I'm still a teacher and a public defender. It just manifests in different forms. Right. Now, clearly you've done a lot um, in your career, but your time with Ashley Stewart yes. um, will always be a footnote somewhere 
yes. in your bio because of the impact it had. It was transformational. And it also, in a lot of ways, wasn't a natural fit, right? Somebody <laughs> calls you up about Ashley Stewart. Yeah. You know, it seems a little bit unusual. So maybe you could tell our viewers as to how you ended up running Ashley Stewart. Sure. Uh, so for everyone listening, I was a private equity person. I was in some tall buildings in Boston. I've owned and invested a lot of companies, both growth and distressed. And uh, in my early 40s, there were a confluence of things happening. There was, I was not enthralled about how my industry was evolving. Uh, there was a real untethering of financial and social capital. Remember, I'm a teacher, mm. so I, it was very poignant to me. I just didn't feel good about how we were making money as much as I did when I first started. I looked around the room as well. I was generally one of the few, if not only, minorities in a lot of the boardrooms I was in, and I started sort of being very conscious of that, particularly with children. Mm -hmm. um, and then my father was dying of Parkinson's. And then there was this company, as you noted, called Ashley Stewart. It was in a portfolio of a former employer. And for those of you who don't know the company, uh, you may think of it just, oh, they sell clothes. Yes, it's for size 12 and up women. But as a historian, when I looked at it, it was more than that. And when I did all the numbers, I said, wow, it's almost exclusively in black neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It's almost exclusively employing black women. And so I said, I don't think it's that. I think it's something more. And you can imagine how that company had been treated by the capital markets for 20 years. And so I didn't like it. And the talk in the boardroom wasn't great. And so they said, James, what are you going to do? And then my life completely changed. I resigned. I, I just said, then I, I'll go. I'll go be interim CEO for six months. Let me figure it out. Let me save as many jobs as I can. I'll come back. And it turned out, uh, which we can go into, it was very lonely. Like I, um, no one came. I thought people would come and help me. No one really came. Right. And it really ended up just being me and a few people um, in the home office, but predominantly it was hundreds, if not a thousand, of predominantly black women across America who they said to me, they're like, it's ride or die. Right. <laughs> and I said, sure. So when you showed up, um, what types of things you think were an issue that you had to tackle and fix? And also, with no one coming to help, yes. why would those same women so instrumental in turning it around because essentially yeah. this, this is not a story you would hear. You would hear that you know, a new CEO would descend, yeah. um, bring in a whole cast of characters, lots of slashing and cutting of things and going for it. And that doesn't seem to be, you, you, saw, you saw things that you could use, but there yes. needed to be some motivation. I think for me, I saw, today happens to be, it would have been my mother's 82nd birthday today. Mm. So the fact that we're doing this today is, it's very meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, I saw the character and strength of my mother in these women. Mm -hmm. That's what I saw. And so I saw these women, they, just the amount of hats they were wearing, not asking for credit. They did what they had to do. Mm -hmm. They were navigating systems, sometimes unbeknownst to them, that were not really aligned in their favor. Right? And that's what I saw, and that's what I bet on. I bet on these women. I think the best thing that I did as CEO um, of that company, particularly in the early days, I didn't, I unlocked their strength. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of work to really unlock it and say, I'm not here to change you, change anything, but you can do this. And so I had to build a system that um, they trusted in. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the math part of me, lawyer part of me, had to make the math work too. But really what I did was that uh, I unleashed. And what you saw, like the sort of the emotion that later on as it started being more successful, um, that's what you saw in the faces of the women. They were just allowed to be themselves. And, and that was enough. 
Yeah, so it's a very, very interesting transformation. So that experience at Ashley Stewart obviously gave you some insight, um, and that's insight that you were applying to Venture Capital before, and you now have a new Venture in Red Helicopter. What is your thesis behind Red Helicopter? What do you hope to accomplish? Sure, I mean, what I learned during Ashley Stewart, what uh, I felt unleashed about, for a long time I had sort of suppressed <laughs> more my creative music side. Mm -hmm. And then what I learned during Ashley Stewart, what we did together, we didn't, we bent systems. And it really dawned on me that the reason why we were able to do what we did was that we had to nudge along certain scaffolding and sort of make up new scaffolding for it to work. And I had underestimated how important it was to sort of have this sort of kid-like mindset and say, we have to imagine and say, why can't we do this? And I feel that here, right? That's one of the things we've talked about, to imagine the world that you want to have. And that's what Red Helicopter is, is that I'm, it's, for now, it's a media ed. It starts with changing minds. Mm -hmm. So part of this, there's a way that I teach. It's here, and you know that I spend time at MIT, too. It really is neuro, math, economics, money, behavior. It's things that I don't think we are teaching our elementary school and middle school kids. It's mm -hmm. like how their brain works. Yep. And we're not teaching them money. And so I combine all of them so that people don't meet money for the first time on Wall Street or never. Mm -hmm. It makes it more normal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm teaching and then from a media side I've been much more active in just explaining this to the world. You know that I did the TED Talk and Brene and Simon to explain what we did, I think most people now understand better what we did at Ashley Stewart. The last two, three years have changed people's minds a bit. They're saying, yeah. ah. And so I get a lot more calls now saying, now we understand what you were talking about. You, you inviting me here, you already <laughs> understood that, yeah. but not everyone did, Dr. Frederick. Right. And so it's accelerating now. And I think a lot of parents are giving me permission to spend time with not just them, but their children mm -hmm. and saying, oh, you know, we, we trust you. Like, mm -hmm. tell them. Like, tell them how this works. And that's what I'm doing. So with that as the backdrop, mm -hmm. and, uh, and as you examine kind of what we're doing now in terms of the paradigm of how we're teaching students, how students are thinking about some of these things and not having money just be the central aspect of it, but recognizing their creativity is important, their mindset yes. of how they come to these things is important. What do you think we should be focused on emphasizing as we think about educating students and preparing them for the next generation? And what should we be de-emphasizing for that matter? I think the main quality that's going to be necessary for young people and for all of us, it's if you had to pick one, I would say it's agility. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I define entrepreneurship, like a, not necessarily starting a company. It's more of a natural agility. It's like that in sports too, right? To be agile is very different than being fast. Yeah. And so uh, to me, the best way to teach agility is what I'm experimenting with all over the place. Now, and, you're and the students here, I think, are really taking to it. It's a systems framework where it's very, uh, it's horizontally connected mm -hmm. rather than hyper-specialized and um, just one knowing one thing is to know the connectivity of everything and when you think like that it makes things like physics math philosophy ethics very important because it, these are very transcendent laws that connect a lot of the quote man-made laws and so that's where I've been emphasizing and the best way to so to communicate this isn't just through numbers and through words. I found the reason why Red Helicopter is so media-centric, sometimes the hardest thing is to ask someone to just shift their perspective just 5%. Mm -hmm. And so with this, if you can shift someone's perspective 5% on 20 things, it leads to profound change mm. and a lot of allies in doing it. So uh, I, I want to pull on that thread a little further. One of the things, obviously, that's taking place right now in our education system, more in our society, but it's impacting our education system, is creative AI. 
yeah. and things like chat GPT and, and I feel we're approaching it from a place of fear where we should be approaching it from a place of embrace and making sure that we control those dynamics. What are your thoughts about the impact that is going to have on entrepreneurship, on business, uh, on actually um, equality in, ter in terms of are we able to really probably bring more people to the table? Are they ac acquiring knowledge or are they really accessing it and figuring out how to apply it? I think that things like AI, machine learning, are going to underscore the importance of the systems framework agility thinking, because so much of the vertical learning, I think, will be more replicable or AI driven. Mm -hmm. The art of it, the creativity of it, is trying to put together six seemingly uncorrelated things and saying, oh, they're, they actually are correlated. Mm -hmm. I would say me sitting here with you and your invitation for me to join the Howard family, there's not a single artificial intelligence that would have predicted that right. 10 years ago. And <laughs> I think I've, you know, on a personal note, my life has been abundant in that way and that I have so many unexpected friends and, mm -hmm. and experiences. But in my own mind, my journey, I know it's called journey, my journey is very serpentine. Yeah. But it's led to a very like, rich life, like a very fulfilling life. And so that's how I view AI. Is that vertical? Sure. But the horizontal connectivity, I'm hopeful it really forces people to really admire the natural intelligence of creativity, like Einstein did. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gets us out of the rut of being uh, rote memorizers and rote learners. So, so th this brings up an important point right? because you've emphasized behavior, you've emphasized ethics, you know, things that to some extent you could say is lacking um, yeah. on Wall Street and in some of these places. But really, when acquired and applied in abundance does seem to lead to uh, folks winning. So with that in mind, the recent issue um, with FTX and um, cryptocurrencies and some of this activity. What, what's your thought process about why we got there? And are these things going to continue to be a problem as we go forward? I think I'm worried. I mean, one of the, I was worried about it enough that one of the central theses of what I was doing at Ashley Stewart was showing people something that was real, like really real, like real emotions, real friendships. You know, we're doing a very good job showcasing people to our young people that we shouldn't be. There's a lot of press coverage of a lot of people that we're looking at them as heroes and I'm, I'm very confused and I'm very vocal about it. It's not a interest rate, it's not a Fed funds rate, it's not any, it's, it's a, I'm worried about social fabric. I'm worried about our lack of investment in public schools I mean, I think it's, history is pretty clear. You don't invest in people, whether it's a company or a country, bad things happen. Um, mm -hmm. Fascism happens. That's generally what happens. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very concerned. And, and your course is titled um, Impact, Investing, ESG, and Life. Yes. ESG is being hammered. Yes. It's almost becoming a political cudgel. But the intent here, again, is to get us to focus on a wider variety of things that impact the social fabric. So we're not just making money for the sake of making money. Yes. And as a matter of fact, disadvantaging others. Why tie that? Why does the ESG drop right in the middle of that? You could have titled it Impact. It's funny, the title that. changed. Right. Yeah, so we, the students and I now refer to it as it's the entrepreneurial journey, systems of money, life, and joy. Mm-hmm. And so ESG is actually not, we, we changed it because of that, that yep. it was, I just, it started becoming not just politicized, but it's a post facto measurement mm -hmm. versus changing root behavior. Yep. And I don't think there's any way to change root behavior that's more effective than um, strong family and strong teachers. And any, there's no shortcuts for that. Right. And so that's why I love being here, <laughs> like yeah. spending time with the students because I feel exhilarated every time I walk out of that classroom. I feel better for it too, right? right? So. And, and when you look at Red Helicopter and I think, you know, ventures going forward, 
let's talk about the public school system just to be probably creative if not provocative. Yeah. It seems as if the private sector needs to invest there for us to get real change because of the lack of agility in most states and in most public school systems. What would you think of an idea of really private investors saying, listen, we, we need more competitive um, schools. How do we impact on investing in them in a way that produces the outcome that we want? It, it, I feel like this question, you're in my head because <laughs> that's uh, a few years ago, I was with the Lieutenant Governor in New Jersey and she asked me, what can the public sector do for the private sector, James? And she was expecting me to say, think about it, Reduce taxes. taxes. Yeah. Regulation. <laughs> Reduce <Yeah>. regulation. I <laughs> said to her, and the whole audience went, oh. I just said, can you please invest better and more wisely in your public education system? That's the number one thing you can do. And she looked at me and said, wow, I've never gotten that answer. And I was disappointed that that was the look I got because I said, why is not everyone yep. saying that? So that's what Red Helicopter is. I have a a way of teaching. It's not just at the CEO level. Mm -hmm. They're fractals. These are core basic principles. So CEO, it, it's expanded fractal. But I'm finding a lot of success teaching it at middle schools too. Right. And I'm getting to them early. Um, and my ho I was just with 150 headmasters at junior high school and high schools in New England last week. And so people want this learning. Mm -hmm. and that's what I'm thinking, and now I'm going to combine it with my private sector relationships. And you know that I just got elected to Ashoka. Mm -hmm. yes. So one of their interests is how do you stop saying social entrepreneur versus entrepreneur? It's just yeah. entrepreneur. And I think that's one of the things that um, I should have said before when you asked me the question about perspective. I've lived a life that's not dualistic. It's a continuum for me, like I'm American, I look like this, I teach at Howard. I mean, it, yeah. for me, it just, I've never really, didn't want to be in a box, and I don't want to put your students, our students in a box either, and that's, yeah. that's the worst thing we can do for young people. Absolutely. Now, you're working on a, a book, your manuscript is, yes. is coming out soon. What types of things are we going to be focused on there? Well, it's not one of the hardest things I've ever done because <laughs> I like people. It's very isolating, like right. writing. Yep. Book's almost done. Um, it's going to be announced maybe in a, in a month or two. Uh, it is a general memoir slash teaching all of these concepts in a very casual style. Mm -hmm. And I hope that the book is almost serves as a soft textbook and an invitation for uh, experts to really slot their content into the various, like a physics expert, yep. right? A neuropsych expert. Mm -hmm. And I hope that it can be a, a collectively owned curriculum. Right. Now, we are in the middle of our admission cycle. We have lots of students applying. Um, our application numbers are up 115% year over year. Um, very competitive uh, to get in, but more importantly, just as competitive with, you know, people making choices. I ask everyone who comes on, why Howard? But more specifically for you, why should somebody come to Howard and take your class in particular? Mm. Well, I think Howard, when you, when we, when you and I first met, there is a reason why, and I'm going to say this on public TV. You know, I got emotional when you asked me. Absolutely. And the reason why I got emotional is, um, you know, obviously it was a very generous offer, but Howard, and it's confirmed since I've been here, the history of Howard is that it represents the type of place that I tried to build at Ashley Stewart. I've tried to live my life. Mm -hmm. It's never discriminated against anyone mm -hmm. from day one. And you can feel it. You can't make it up. That's why Howard, yes, the academic credentials and the hit, it's great, but that spirit, it's very rare to find that anywhere. Mm. And so that's why I'm, I, that's why I asked you, you said one year, I said three. Yeah. So, <laughs> and that's why I come down here every Thursday. I'm like, it's, that, that, that's, that's what I would say about Howard. And I, I'll give you an example of this. As I've been writing this book, I found out something pretty cool. 
there's a, uh, you know, with both my parents gone, they, their lives are in this book. And I'm weaving it together with the lives of like, uh, you may be in the book actually, I have to ask your permission, <laughs> but uh, you may or may not be right now in chapter 10. <laughs> we'll talk about this. Um, just weaving their life in with yours, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I found out there's a song in Korea. It's basically like the, it's like God Bless America, that type of song. It's not the national anthem. It's called Adidam. Mm. And every Korean person in Korea sings it. It's just part of who you are. And because I was born here, you know, that was, I, I was cut off from a lot of that. I want you to know that song, the first time, and it's UNESCO protected song, 600 years old. No one knows who, right. it's a folk song. No one knows who, in, uh, who wrote it. The first time that song was ever recorded was in D.C. Mm. And in my research, uh, the students from Korea who sang it here, you know where they were going to school? <laughs> Howard. Amazing. And I think that story to me encapsulates what makes this school special. And it's a global school. We talked about That's this. Right. Howard is based in D.C. But when I think 50 to 100 years from now, like I can see, I hope very clearly what Howard will be, should be globally. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic story to end with. Thanks for being here. My guest today was James Ree, the Johnson Chair of Entrepreneurship in the Cathy Hughes School of Communications here at Howard University. I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick. Please join me next time on The Journey. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.